Unauthorized opinions expressed on the internet would be censored. We are live. We are live. This is real. Welcome back to Unauthorized Opinions, uopod.com. Like, share, subscribe. It's pure propaganda and it's super cringe, by the way. I literally went to the polls with nothing in mind. I saw a can of orange soda in the parking lot. <laughs> and it's I was like, yeah, there we go. An unopened can of orange soda just chilling <laughs> in the parking lot. I was like, yeah, I got to vote for Trump, dude. Your podcast sucks it's mental mate it's absolutely mental i'll be honest i thought it was kind of offensive when you talk so much about the loch ness monster political climate and andrew treat yourself okay especially if you start i don't know getting getting in good with homeless people unauthorized opinions streaming everywhere at uopod.com <laughs> welcome back to unauthorized opinions uopod.com, patreon.com slash uopod if you're interested in the bonus content. We have so much to get to today. This episode is brought to you by the people who called me, you know, homeless, the people said who said I was a Justin Trudeau supporter, people who said I was a Pierre Pauly of simp after last week. I guess with the views comes the haters. Maybe you saw me on Newsmax this past week, Bianca De La Garza's show, we love those over at Newsmax and let's just jump into what causes me the most controversy I guess last week I started off by saying Justin Trudeau had made admitted he made a mistake with the immigration system saying that they didn't calculate it properly and that he's going to start rolling people back and I said this is going to open up Pierre Pauly have talking about it more and more and more. So last week we talked about a clip of him where he said Justin Trudeau had actually screwed up the immigration system. And I said that this is, had stemmed from the People's Party of Canada putting out a platform that was saying to put a pause on immigration and it was extremely popular and I said it would shift the window a little bit because that's what they're talking about in the U.S. I don't know if you noticed in the Donald Trump rallies leading up to the election, there was mass deportations now signs. And in a country up here in beautiful, great white Canada, that is the sentiment, at least the sentiment of most people is that there's too many people here. I don't know if they've gotten to deportations yet. However, they, this is effectively what people want is fewer people here. And there is probably a couple million too many people here. So now... Pierre Polyev has taken this chance where Trudeau has said finally that there's a problem with his immigration system, even though he blames it on different, you know, universities and employers who are following his rules. But Pierre Polyev has taken this and he knows now that he can start to talk about it. So he's slowly escalating his rhetoric, which I'm in favor of. So previously they had said, you know, we just need to make sure the people who overstay their visas go home now the Conservative Party is talking about half a million people overstaying uh, their work visas. He's talking about, I believe it was 2.4 million people whose visas are set to expire at the end of 2025. And, you know, even though they are yet to talk about how many people are here um, through regular immigration, I mean, that's almost 3 million people that would be gone if all the rules were actually followed, which I think a lot of people would be happy with, no matter what their race is, right? They'll, everybody on the left wing, or at least the hardcore left wingers, will try to make it a racial argument or an ethnic argument. It's not. It's just about the sheer amount of people that have brought into the con been brought into the country, which makes everything unaffordable and uh, crowded. So let's see what Pierre escalated to this week. And this was in the House of Commons. And it's actually pretty funny. He, he, he's got the, he's always had the quips, but now he's starting to say things that I agree with, which he hasn't necessarily for half the time in the last few years. But I think most people who are, you know, let's call them beginning levels, conservatives, all the way to the extreme reaches of the far right can now agree with. This weak prime minister has lost control. He's lost control of immigration, lost control of our borders. And now we're facing massive threats to our economy. Right now, there are as many as 500,000 people here illegally. 
There are 700,000 students who came here with the implicit promise they'd be able to stay forever, and now they're being told they have to leave with the temptation that they might head south for the much stronger economy than we have here, which would provoke a massive retaliatory tariff. So what's the plan to reverse all the damage the Prime Minister's done? Hundreds of thousands of people come here <laughs> as temporary residents, and then they leave. Some become permanent residents. There is a plan to achieve that. They will migrate into permanent residency, but not all can stay here. I mean, we're a little bit backwards to start here. Um, people don't want all these people to stay here who are temporary students. Just because the universities make money, just because the universities benefit from having these students here and paying double the price for tuition, and, you know, Tim Hortons and Walmart benefit from all these people coming here who barely speak English, by the way, and working at lower wages through specialized visas subsidized by the government doesn't mean people actually just want to plan for them to stay. That's not what what people are arguing here for. They're people people are arguing for how do we reduce all of this? And so Pierre started off with, you know, 1.2 million people there in combination with illegal immigrants and student work visas. But I think the idea here is everybody would like those people to no longer be in the country. For the most part, I think more than half the country believes that. I'm confident in saying about at least 60% think that there are way too many people here and the people who are here temporarily who end up staying most of the time need to return to their country of origin whether it's Iceland or New Zealand or whatever you guys want to say and when they refuse to do so they will be removed Mr. Speaker that member uh, hallucinates almost as badly <laughs> as, as his weak leader who refuses to stand and answer for his own for border failures. Let's look at his re his record. He opened Roxham Road. He kept it open for a year longer than the Americans required. He put out a tweet saying, welcome to Canada, inviting people to come here illegally. According to that minister's department, there are half a million people here illegally, all of whom could be tempted to go south of the border, provoking a massive retaliatory response. So once again, what's the plan to fix what he broke? Yeah. So before we get into his ad there, of course, they have no real plan. Their plan, just like the uh, far left liberals in the Democrat Party in the United States, and what they wanted to do was naturalize these citizens. This is what the liberals want to do. Now, don't get me wrong. The Conservative Party of Canada wants to naturalize a whole bunch of people that they believe would vote for them. A lot of Middle Eastern people because they are not super liberal in the purest form of their belief systems. But. Justin Trudeau's liberals don't have a plan. They know they're on their way out. So would it be in their best interest to try to legalize all these temporary residents as fast as possible? Of course it would, because they will be thankful. In particularly, in particular, sorry, um, a lot of the Indian immigrants or the temporary workers, as they are affectionately known as, um, they are very big into, how can I say this? without being thrown off the internet. They're very big into agreeing with the party that let them stay here and let them come here, voting-wise. So it's not that big of a stretch of the imagination to imagine that they would want these people to stay here because they will more than likely vote for them. They don't have um, a strong history of resisting the powers that be and are liberal voters what else can i say it's not the same you, you know i know one guy who's uh who's middle eastern and he is an immigrant and he doesn't believe in a lot of the stuff in fact i know several guys like that they don't believe in almost anything the liberals um believe in but when you talk about new immigrants they're so grateful to come to this country and get this permanent status that they will just like anywhere this is with the exact promise in the United States. We will open the border, allow tons of people in, and then even though they're coming in illegally, we will legalize them and we will put them in places that are swing states and then we will win all future elections. That's the only hope that the Justin Trudeau liberals have to win back seats because the vast majority of people, except for like boomers on the East Coast, um, have understood that the charade is up. You know, other people on the far left who are NDP voters, you know, 
that's almost better than thinking that Justin Trudeau loves you and is telling you the truth. And the other day I was around somebody who, who really still is in that mantra of the government wants to take care of you and love you and the taxes are for a good reason. I think the majority of people, though, have gotten beyond that. So I want to switch over to Dr. Jordan Peterson, who people got mad at me for saying that Pierre <laughs> sounded like him last week uh, in tone of voice. You can't do this to the children. Um, he was on Fox News talking about the immigration system a little bit and its failures. And, you know, I love the way he is not willing to hold anything back in his criticism of Trudeau because of all they've taken from him. Really, the, the liberal movement in Canada has taken a lot from Jordan Peterson, and he has no qualms, given his status, about just calling them out on their bullshit. It's pretty nice. Let's watch. Uh, we have Justin Trudeau who came out <laughs> and starting to realize, if you don't mind, I do this. That Peterson couldn't even make it three <laughs> seconds without holding that back. That there's a little problem with illegal immigration in this country and it's overwhelming everything. Here's what he said to the Canadian people. Immigration. Let's talk about it. In the last two years, our population has grown really fast, like baby boom fast. And increasingly, bad actors like fake colleges and big chain corporations have been exploiting our immigration system for their own interests. So we're doing something major. We're reducing the numbers of immigrants that will come to Canada for the next three years. Why? Pause there to let you know that he says for the next three years, he's reducing it only down to 365,000, which is still at least 100,000 people more per year than pre-COVID numbers. So we're redu we've, we screwed up the immigration. We didn't calculate it properly. People are taking advantage of our rules that we've set the last decade. So we're going to reduce it for only three years and only to an amount that's still more than we ever had before. So we've increased it overall. It's like when they say inflation has gone down, shouldn't you be happy? It's like inflation was at 7% for a couple years, and even though it never goes, that additional cost you have never goes away and gets piled on top of each other, we've lowered er, uh, inflation down to 2 or 3% or whatever it is now. It all adds up. So even though they are, they're reducing the immigration down to 365, it's actually just been ballooned up past that. Go from 175 to 250,000 here. And then during COVID, we go up to like a million. And they're like, oh, we're going to bring it back down to 365, which is still more than it initially was. But we'll hold it here temporarily because you're stupid. I mean, that's how they talk to you. It's like, we're going to lower it for three years. That ought to do it. That ought to change everything. No, the people are still here. You're just adding slightly less. There's already too many people. The infrastructure is not going to grow, you know, to accommodate five times as many people over the course of three years. It doesn't make any sense. But trust us this time. We've got it this time, you guys. Why has he found, uh, why has he found this fortuitous for him to talk about immigration? Why is he changing his tone? Well, he's changing his tone because the policies that he put in place, which demolished the Canadian immigration system and threw the borders wide open, upending decades of effective immigration policy in Canada, have caused a catastrophic crisis in the country. And now you could see that he was blaming that on educational institutions and bad corporate actors. And that's exactly typical of him and his 14-year-old mentality. Everything that's gone wrong on the immigration front in Canada is 100% attributable to Justin Trudeau and his pack of demented minions. <laughs> so now it's gone so badly in Canada that he has no choice but to reverse course. And then to see him flailing around to find someone to blame is exactly as pathetic as you'd expect from <laughs> someone like him. It is similar that they both flew open the borders. They denied it was a problem, and now they can't deny it. And they're trying to save their uh, they're start trying to save their political fortunes. Let's talk about your book now. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> I know. I hear you. Uh, There's so much anger in his voice, you can't help but appreciate it. And I wish that there would be a bit more anger with Pierre Polyev in regards to this. Maybe he's building up to everything we want. I don't know. Maybe he's building up to an immigration morator moratorium. I personally. To get my opinion out there, I would not be happy with anything less than 200,000 people a year. And I think we have to get 
that can only happen because like I said, we've already let so many people in. That can only happen. We can only accept those numbers if we send back this half a million people who are here illegally. If we send back the 2.4 million people who have overst- who will probably overstay their work permits. We don't need all these people. So if 3 million people are gone, as in have left the country by the end of next year, I think we can go back down to normal numbers. But I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think they're going to tell these people to get out because that would be considered mean. Um, I think there, there needs to be basically a pause on immigration at this point. When you look around the major cities of Canada, everything is completely unaffordable. You can go to places, gigantic places like Walmart, and have people working there not speaking English at all, congregating, not speaking English at all. And I don't mean people who are customers. I mean the staff. Tim Horton, same thing. This is, it, it's a gigantic problem. Cost of livings are way up. And everybody says, no, it's not the immigration problems, not everybody. But the liberals say it's not an immigration problem. It's an infrastructure problem. What do you think is easier? Having less people come here or building wider roads, which we can't do. Creating land for more homes, which they're not doing. Because people don't want to live in the middle of nowhere where there's land. They want to live in the city centers. So they're just cramming everybody in with condos and townhouses. Building more stores, building more schools, building more hospitals. What's easier, doing all of that or just letting fewer people in? You tell me. Log- I know, and if you're a liberal, and sometimes if you're uh, you know, a capital C conservative or whatever the name is for following the party lines, I know your instinct is to say that this is based on hatred or racism or xenophobia or whatever it is. It's ba- it, Remove your girlish emotions from it, and if you're a girl... I can't help you, (laughs) but remove your emotion from it and realize that it's much easier to say, hey, less people should come here. And even a lot of the people who are here temporarily should go back upon the end of their contract. It's a lot easier to do that than build more roads, more highways, more schools, more hospitals, more houses. A lot easier. Remove your urge that you've been told as a child when you were when you were told Toronto's the most multicultural city in the world. It's the greatest thing to ever happen since sliced bread. Dempster's factory in Ontario. Shout out Dempster's. It's the great. We can't be mean. We have to accept everyone. It doesn't make any sense. People will fly across the world because they are given things. They are given advantages because the Liberal Party wants voters. Same thing in the United States. People will go and fly into Mexico and other states and make that dangerous trek because they are offered free things. And people say, no, they don't get free things. That is a lie. They get free things that regular citizens don't. In Canada, they get higher health care tiers. They get more assistance. They get yearly government, you want to call it wages? Wages are usually for an exchange for work. Bursary, we can call it grants. For a living, they're allowed to live, rel- bring relatives in through chain migration, even if they're elderly or sick, and then the taxpayer pays for it. You are paying for people from other countries to come in and raise the cost of living. So you pay taxes to pay for other people to have an easier life that aren't even from here. Does that make sense to you? It shouldn't. And that's exactly what they do in the United States. They do it even worse. In New York, they gave illegal immigrants visa prepaid cards in california they give them free health care free tuition all this stuff so that they don't have to put their names through a federal assistance program and be flagged as they are illegal immigrants think about the idea of what it takes to be an illegal immigrant with all the things you need as a citizen a driver's license a social insurance number all these things that have to be faked there are many many crimes happening along the way to exist as an illegal immigrant And in Canada, where they sort of just, you know, half a million is half a million. It's nowhere near the 20 million in the U.S. in terms of illegal immigrants. In Canada, we just let them all in. And then what happens? Do you get a... Just look at the before and after. Do you get a flourishing market? Do you get a market that is... You know, everybody's making money. We've brought in all these people and income tax is going up and everything's doing better because of this flood of 
income going out into the economy. That's not what happens. That's obviously not what happens. Everything's become more expensive. And if you say that's the economy's fault, then you must be blaming Justin Trudeau. So you must be admitting that some of his policies are stupid or because he's had 10 years to do it or incorrect or however friendly you want to be about Justin Trudeau. But the fact is, it is incompetent leadership and nobody really wants to listen to this thing anymore where it's like, we have to, we have to help everyone, even though I don't work and I pay, don't pay taxes. It's not up to the taxpayer to coddle the world. And that's what Justin Trudeau and people who are super rich don't really understand because it doesn't affect them. That it's not up to the average person to make their guilt or their dreams or their evil plans come true. That's all I'm saying. Fewer people equals less cost of living increases. You can't convince me otherwise because it's not true. You can't convince me that, I mean, maybe you could, but it seems like a simple equation. More roads, more hospitals, more schools, more infrastructure, or just fewer people. Let me know how that's been working out for you in the last few years. If you live in Vancouver, Toronto, or Montreal, or Calgary, has it been, have things gone cheaper? Even though the liberal dream of loving the whole world has come true, have, has things been better? No. It, and if you want to suffer because you want to have this magical feeling of feeling better about yourself, that's on your own time. Uh, down in Australia, another Commonwealth country, the ABC, which is the Australian Broadcasting Company, has started to blame Joe Rogan. You know, Australia is a little bit behind. They're even more behind than we are here. I would wager behind in different ways than England is. They're really still on... This disinformation and... Wait, God, tuned Austrian. This disinformation and misinformation. And I'm going to blame Joe Rogan. They're blaming Joe Rogan and saying it's inconceivable that people would actually listen to him. This is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's boss. I believe he's the chairman. Um, named Kim Williams, no questions asked. And let's see what he had to say. Um, I have a question about... I have a question about Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. And you've sort of touched on elements of this in the US. He's obviously the world's most popular podcast host. He has three billion listeners. He's sort of managed to successfully capture that bro market in America. And his influence... That's insulting right off the bat, is that bro market. The only people who listen to Joe Rogan must be bros. Three billion bros. ...is such that in the wake of the US election, the Democrats have said that one of Kamala Harris's mistakes was that she didn't appear on his program. So I'm just wondering if you had any observations about what's behind the Joe Rogan effect, how you believe he's managed to so successfully capture this huge market. And then for us here in Australia, you know, how would or should the ABC be going about capturing that kind of audience? Look, I, I'm not sure that I'm the right person to respond to that question. I, I am not a, a, um, a consumer or enthusiast about Mr Rogan and his, his work. Shocking. Um, I, I am not one of the three billion, <laughs> um, and I'm unlikely to be three billion and one any time soon. All right, important note to make there that he says he's not a consumer of Joe Rogan or an enthusiast. So at best, he's seen, what, some clips. If he's not a consumer of it, he's seen a few clips that he didn't like. He doesn't really watch the show. Is that? I think that's fair to say. Um, I, I think people like um, Mr. Rogan um, prey on people's vulnerabilities. They prey on fear. They prey on anxiety. They prey on, on all of the, the elements that contribute to uncertainty in society. And they entrepreneur um, fantasy outcomes and conspiracy outcomes as, as, as being no, a normal part of social narrative. Um, I personally find it deeply repulsive. And um, to think that someone has such remarkable power in, in the United States is, is something that I look at in disbelief. I'm also absolutely in dismay that this can be a source of, of public entertainment when it's really treating the public as plunder for, for, for purposes that are really quite malevolent. 
what an amazing flurry of statements he made there. Joe Rogan's content is repulsive. It treats the population as if they're idiots. It's dangerous. It's conspiratorial. It acts as if dreams and fa fantastical outcomes are common practice and part of society. Absolutely none of this is obviously true about Joe Rogan. First of all, he's a comedian, so there is a degree of jest with his programming, but he also has, like, are you saying that the athletes, science experts, health experts, climate experts, comedians, uh, politicians, what else is there on there? You know, businessmen, all these people he has on and speaks to, it's shocking to you that this is entertaining to people? I'm shocked that 3 billion people have watched and enjoyed this podcast. So what you're saying is you're better and per and able to identify this content better than the 3 billion people who actually watch it after he admitted that he doesn't really watch it. That's what he's saying. What we have here is there's some sort of, you know, overrepresentation of weird looking evil guys in media <laughs> that happen to disagree with everything you like when, when is there going to be you know a guy who doesn't look like he's been deep in a lab constructing some way to take over the world when are we going to have a guy who doesn't look like that come out and tell us about disinformation it's always the same guys who look like they would have been in a 1960s James Bond film telling you stroking a cat just being like your information is, in fact, disinformation, Mr. Bond. Except in this case, he's Australian, so it's a wallaby, I guess. <laughs> he's petting or something. Complete, you know, they've cornered the market on this type of, of, of content, these guys who look like evil masterminds. But I want to show you more of what this guy in his skull said because he spoke at a... He spoke at a conference about misinformation. He's from, like I said, he's from the state broadcaster. And this is available on theblaze.com, written by yours truly. Kim Williams, he's a former media executive who's now the chair of the state-run ABC. And he spoke to the Australian National Press Club. Williams consistently made references to floods and tsunamis regarding an alleged increase in false information, stating that the government broadcaster needs to do a better job of provi providing lifeboats to citizens, especially young ones. So yeah, this is most of what he said in his speech, which you can find if you go through this link here. He, All he talks about is how misinformation is like a natural disaster and it's people are drowning and struggling to stay afloat, so we need to provide them life rafts. It's all... Like I said, exactly the way an evildoer would. <laughs> you're drowning. You need me help. Wait, you're drowning. You need our help to get onto the lifeboats. You do. Um, when he was uh, so, this is just about what he said to this woman who asked him the question, calling Joe Rogan de deeply repulsive. But then it goes on. Williams also claimed that the predominant sources of false information in the world are as follows. Vladimir Putin funded bot farms. Andrew Tate's poisonous videos and artificial intelligence. I'm not exaggerating at all. He, This is what he says in there. He blames Twitter bots that are funded by Russia. He says things like Andrew Tate's poisonous videos and AI are what are convincing people of false information. And of course, this would include Joe Rogan. Therefore, what do you think he wanted? Before we don't read ahead, don't read ahead. And for your audio listeners, don't think ahead. What do you think he called for? Did you think he wanted for, you know, people to pay more attention to what they're listening to or what their children are listening to and watching? Did he call for, you know, people to look into multiple sources when they're doing and do their own research? Or did he call for, you know, people to be a bit, little bit more critical of what they hear and make sure they hear both sides and, and try to find out the facts behind what people are talking about. Do you, which one of those do you think he did? Because the answer is none of them. I'm sure you figured that out. The answer actually was he wanted more money, of course. He said, as the poisoned waters of the tsunami rise, it's good to get 
the young especially, into lifeboats. They are particularly vulnerable to the flood. Their minds are precious assets needed for future success. But lifeboats are always flimsy protections against surging tides. And one day our young will have to swim for themselves in poisoned seas. So they and everyone else will need to be better prepared. And that calls for an extra investment. Williams then called for an increase in government-backed fact-checking, children's programs, and curriculum. So, how do we combat misinformation? Well, we brainwash the kids from the outset. We need more money for government fact-checks. Things that everybody loves, right? Government fact-checks, government children's programs, government-run curriculum. These are all things people think can never be corrupt. He concluded his speech by saying the ABC needs to attract younger audiences as a matter of in intergenerational equity... And he also wants to train a new generation of young journalists. Again, if you want to verify what I've written here, you can go to this link and read his transcript to the National Press Club and see that he just talks about flood tsunamis and how the government broadcaster needs more money to convince people of what the real truth is, right? We want the real truth, the real Australian truth, not this poisonous Joe Rogan truth. That would be upsetting. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about today is electric vehicles. Now, friend of the show, uh, Mocha Bazurgan over at Media Bazurgan, great friend of the show, uh, accused international espionage agent, Mocha Bazurgan. I don't know if that's actually true or not. We love Mocha. He's a citizen. Come on now. And he's not a double agent. Or, no, I'm just kidding. He'll be mad at me for that. Um, he's constantly telling me about um, electric cars and, well... You know, having an electric car and the automated driving, how wonderful it is. And I'm like, Mocha, it's great that you have this car that you like, but I can't wait till the winter comes and you have to pre precondition it for 30 minutes before you can even drive in the morning. You got to start your car at a uh, half an hour before you want to go. Um, so that it can only drive another half an hour until it gets too cold for it. But people are accusing the Biden of administration of blowing tons of money um, on electric charging stations, which they actually haven't built. And I've written a lot about this over the last couple of years about the electric car industry, and it has not done particularly well. Uh, everybody's sales goals have dropped because they didn't meet their, meet their original goals. The There is no used electric car market. Everybody has slowed production across the board. Only Toyota has sort of said, hey, this isn't working publicly and said we're going to shift towards hybrid. That's uh, a better choice in the short run rather than jumping and forcing people into electric cars. But across Canada and the United States, they said we're going to build these giant public funded networks of charging stations and superchargers. And they even said, please, Mr. Elon Musk, help us build these stations. In Canada, they said, hey, we got tons of stations. We just don't know where they put them. But we just talked about government fact checks in Australia, but this is government fact check in Can or in the United States and yes, an Associated Press, blah blah blah. But this is, you know, effectively the deep state's own fact checking. Post misrepresent Biden administration spending on EV charging stations. So the claim is, of course, that Pete Buttigieg, who is the you know super hetero. Minister of Transportation in the United States, or Secretary of Transportation, excuse me. How's that for gender neutral? And he, the claim is that he's blown through $7.5 billion and he built nothing, essentially. But we are here at the Associated Press to fact check that. The claim misrepresents. The claims misrepresent funding set aside by the 2021 Infrastructure and Jobs Act, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law for a national network of publicly available electric vehicle chargers. Biden has set a goal of creating 500,000 chargers by 2030. So the idea, of course, fact-checking this would be like, wow, people must be lying about that. They must be horribly misinformed. But imagine, put yourself in the shoes of a person right now who says, that's wrong. The government is actually doing a great job. I must defend it, defend them and put the facts where they rest and be on their side and correct this for the public. That's what the per that's what you assume this would be, but this is what you actually end up writing. The facts, that's incorrect. 
The $7.5 billion figure refers to the total amount allocated through the 2021 law to build a network of charging stations across the U.S., not the amount that has already been spent. There are currently 214 operational chargers in 12 states that have been funded through the law, with 24,800 projects underway across the country. So, the claim, of course, hey, some guy just being along the lines of Pete Buttigieg gave seven point took $7.5 billion to make a network of electric chargers and nothing's been built. He wasted all the money. That's the claim. And you're just like, actually, that's not true. He didn't blow through $7.5 billion. That's actually just as mu- the amount that's been allocated for this program. And they've built 214 charger- chargers so far in the first four years. And it's actually going to, the rest is going to get done, okay? And that's what they say here. They Where do they continue on here? Um, $7.5 billion has not been spent, Buttigieg says, nor anything like that. Adding that federally funded chargers are built by individual states, not the federal government, and that most will be built in the second half of the 2020s. So on one hand, he blames that the states haven't built them, so it's not his fault. But on the other hand, he says they're all going to be built in the second half. So actually, they're all supposed to be built when I'm not in office. That's the claim here. Hey, we had four years to build, maybe, you would think, four out of ten years if it's supposed to be between, or nine years, if it's supposed to be between between 2021 and 2030. So in those three years, it's really four, but we'll call it three, to get from 21 to 24 to 27 to 30. So in three of those nine years, they're supposed to build 500,000 chargers. You would think that they would build 133,000 chargers or um, 175,000, somewhere around there, 150,000 chargers. Because if you do that in nine years, or sorry, like 75,000 even, I don't even know what the calculation is. Let's find out. 500,000 divided by nine years equals... 55,000 multiplied by 3. So they should have built at least 166,000. I was pretty close. 166,000 in the first 3 or 4 years. If we're counting it 4 years, over 200,000. But they've built a grand total of 214. We've built, we've had 3 or 4 years. It's the state's fault, but we've actually built 214. The rest will be built in the next 6 or 5 years. And that's not our fault. It's actually the next. It, it the, He says the federal government doesn't control this, and it's actually up to the states. But then he says it's going to be done in the next five years instead of when we did it. So if it doesn't get done, then you can blame the federal government after us. And this is what Pete Buttigieg did. Most of his term was under uh, parental leave, like for having a uh, paternity leave because he had a pretend baby well the baby's probably real but he purchased the baby and with his husband and why should he have to build more than 214 operation why it's the state's fault i just allocated the money it's the state's fault they they didn't want to build them but actually it'll happen under the next administration if it doesn't it's not my fault i only had to build like one percent it's not even a micro fraction of what i was told to build and this is a fact check And, you know, I don't like to pick on people, but when they are literally being just puppets for the government at this point, we've done this before on the show. We start to look in like who the into who these writers are. And this is a woman named Melissa Golden, who is a news verification reporter, the Associated Press, previously NewsGuard. So she, you know, she has chosen as a profession to work for publications in the let's call it the genre of trying to ruin people's lives where you are saying actually you're a liar here's how i've proven you're a liar by slightly twisting the words and saying that you're misleading people (laughs) you said he blew through all the money he's actually only allocated all the money and only built 400 fucking (laughs) chargers how dare you make these claims um and I guess her last post was about the false claims about Tim Waltz. He's actually an amazing person who's an avid hunter and 
enthusiast and he was in the military and he's a football coach and all these things. So I want to let you people know, you people, I want to let everybody know that when somebody takes a job like this and they write probably freelance articles, unless they're a staff writer for these, um, for the Associated Press, I don't know if that's even a thing. But judging by how little content she's putting out. These are probably freelance articles. She's probably making no more than $50 for these things. So you're selling your soul. Melissa, you're free to come on the show. Explain to me why I'm wrong. Fact check me. Say that you're actually making $45 per post instead of 30. I He said 30 to 50. Actually, that's incorrect. Fact check. It's actually 45. You piece of shit. <laughs> Feel free to come on the show and disprove me. But these are people who are willing to, you know lay down the tiles and the groundwork for what you could call a deep state or the perpetual government or the, you know, oligarchical class, whatever you want to perceive it as, and defend them over slight discrepancies in what people say. He didn't spend $7.5 million. He actually just allocated it and did nothing with it. That's not the same thing. That's not even nearly the same thing. All for like $35 an article. That's what some people are willing to do. Maybe that's being called an NPC. I don't know. I'm just an NPC myself. But as a person who has struggled and grinded for, I don't know, a thousand years at this point, you come across these decisions in your life. I'm going to say every couple of months, should I write this even though it's kind of misleading? Um, Should I make this title this? Should I make this leap, this intellectual leap? And the answer should always be no. If you have to question it, you have to question whether or not what you're saying is a stretch or if it's um, unnecessarily damaging to somebody just to further your own self. The answer is, I'm going to say 99% of the time, no, you should not do that. But there are some people out there who just say 35 bucks, um, make a fool of myself really, claim that Pete Buttigieg is actually a stand-up guy and he made 400 electric chargers with seven and a half billion dollars over the course of his first four years and said it actually is supposed to happen uh in the next five years when i'm not here if that's what you want to do i guess that's what you want to do but that's why no one will remember your name turn it up jordan